to maximum attack rallying. I'm going to start this video with an apology. Uh, it's been far too long. Um, I was hoping to do a video every week. Obviously, with travelling to the UK, that threw things up into the air a little bit. Uh, I went to Barham, which we'll get onto in a bit. Um, then came back to Saudi Arabia, got ill, um, and it all fell apart a little bit. So the schedule is a mess. I feel like I'm gonna talk about bar and rally a bit too long after the event, if that makes sense. But um, there's some other things that have happened that we can talk about as well around it. So it'll kind of fix itself. I've come up with a plan. Uh, so I hope you'll enjoy the ride. Uh, as I record this on Friday, the Acropolis rally has actually started. I'm not gonna talk about that too much. Thierry Newville's in the lead, but Obviously, there's been lots of bad weather in the run-up to the event. The schedule's been changed. Recce was disrupted. Shakedown was cancelled. All this stuff. But we'll talk about that in the next video when we can actually talk about it properly because we'll know what the result is because right now, it's still happening. Uh, you'll hopefully be watching this on the Saturday, so we'll be a little bit further. So there's no point me talking about it because if I'm recording now on Friday and I end up uploading on Saturday, then um, we just... It's all a mess, isn't it? So we'll talk about that next time. Um, so I want to talk about Barham. Um, a couple of things have come out, just quick news bits. Uh, Subaru, there is rumours of Subaru coming back to WRC, which would be amazing, interesting, because they don't have an engine, but Toyota have suggested, apparently this has come out through the FI president, the president that they would possibly help, so they might supply an engine, I suppose. Or So that, yeah, that's interesting for sure. Um, I also want to touch on Rally Keradigion, which was last weekend, I think. Um, great event, and that's going to segue me nicely into Barham, because um, what I really impresses me about Keradigion is that they are running that event very much in the in the mould of, of European rallies. You know, they're very focused on the town centre kind of start and focal point and special, having a super special stage and. Um, I just think they've got such a different outlook to, to what's gone before, you know, um, and I put something up on Instagram the other day talking about how it highlighted issues with the BRC, and I don't want to get into that, um, there's an article on Instagram which you can read, and um, I think it, it, the event did highlight some other issues with the sport, but I think it it's such a good event, and they're so forward looking, and they're doing all the right things, and I really hope they get into ERC. Uh, but the article I wrote, Marion Evans, who was competing at uh, Kerry Diggin, actually responded and said it was the best rally that he'd done this year, which is, again, high praise, and I'm sure he's better placed to speak about it than I am. So, yeah, really good. But that does provide a nice segue into Barham, because while Kerry Diggin wants to be in the ERC, Barham already is. So I think we should talk about that, shouldn't we? So Barham, yes, I did go to that event. Uh, it feels a really long time ago now, but I did go. Um, yeah, re I was really impressed with it. Um, I would say, I've, I actually wrote something in uh, Bob Irvin's Rally Sport News Magazine, which you can find a link to on my Instagram, and on my LinkedIn, and on my Twitter, and on my, what's the other one, threads, um, which is a free rally newspaper, PDF, downloadable. Definitely, definitely read that, because it's lots of, uh, good stuff and it covers everything from clubman rallying right up to WRC so it's really good it's free free remember very important so I definitely read that but I, I did talk a little bit about the experience of going to Barham in, in a feature in there it was really good and if you do get the opportunity I definitely recommend it because even alongside the rally itself um, if you're going from the UK which there's a good chance you are if you're watching this um, you will probably fly to Prague and Prague is a really beautiful city and what I loved about it, for me, obviously not living in the UK right now, um, it was a chance for me to not just go to a rally, but also to travel with some friends. So, you know, I think it, it was really nice that we could double that up because not all of the people that I went with are super rally people. In the, you know, they're not rally mad like I am. Um, so while they enjoyed the rally, it was also an opportunity for us to just go on holiday and have fun. And Prague is such an amazing place, really beautiful city, stunning architecture. Very well priced, very friendly people, just a really nice place to visit. So if you're gonna do a rally in Europe, I would certainly consider it from that perspective because if you wanna go on holiday a little bit at the same time, it's kind of a really nice way to combine that. Um, I do wanna talk about the rally more. Um, 
specifically, um, obviously from a results perspective, Hayden Padden crashed out of the event but still uh, became European champion um, because he had a very comfortable points lead and his rival Martin Sesk only finished 12th, I think, didn't he? So, um, so from a competitive perspective, it was really good. Uh, Jan Kopetsky actually won the ERC section, which was, I think it was his 11th win, wasn't it? So that was impressive. I actually think in results terms, what was slightly more impressive is that a crew in a 2006-ish Focus WRC won the event outright, um, which feels like a bit of a rarity now, doesn't it? I think we have kind of accepted that Rally 2 cars are now so fast, and obviously in an ERC setting, they're being driven by very talented drivers, that a WRC car isn't very likely to win an event now, but as it happened in, in, in Barham, it did. So that was, uh, so that was good. Um, but what I wanted to talk about in this video, not the results as such, um, because obviously it's a, it's a little bit of a long time ago and you've probably seen it anyway. There was just a few things from the event that I wanted to pick up on that partly take us back to Keridigian and, and I think just the difference between UK events, or some UK events I should say, uh, because events like Keridigian are kind of moving past some of the issues. Um, but just, I think there's this thing in Europe with, with events being so different to how they are um, in the UK, and there's just some really important things that they do um, that I think we could learn from. You know, if you're an organiser in the UK, there are definitely things that you could learn if you go to Czech Republic, Belgium, France, you know, all these different places. So that's kind of what I want to focus on for the next few minutes. Um, so where should we begin with that? Let's begin with the historics and I will insert some videos and things while I'm talking um, so you can get a better sense of what I'm actually talking about um, rather than just me rabbiting at the screen because that's a bit boring, isn't it? We want to make these videos more exciting so you actually watch them. So through a, a, a twist of fate, I didn't actually get to see the historic rally in action. Um, we'd hoped to see them on stage six on Saturday, but with John Armstrong, Armstrong's crash, thankfully he's okay, um, we didn't actually get to see the historics because stage six was cancelled before they got the chance to come through. But again, just as I found when I went to Ypres a few years ago, it just, historic rallying in, in Europe is so far ahead of where we are in the UK. And I know people probably get a bit fed up with me ranting about escorts and things, but the entry list for the historic rally, Star Rally it was called, was was amazing. What I love about the Czech Republic is they just kind of ignore the whole FIA historic thing because that kind of runs up to, to 1990. But at Star Rally you had Evos, uh, Impretas, Escort Cosworths, and McGann, Maxi on the entry, which I was gutted I didn't get to see by the way. It actually retired by the time uh, stage six happened and I didn't even get to see it in service unfortunately. Um, but you will see a few pictures, obviously, from service. Um, yeah, it's just, I love it. And obviously, being the Czech Republic, there were quite a few scoters, which you would expect, but there was just such variety, and, and not just a variety of manufacturers and types of cars, so there was Group A stuff, Group 4 stuff, Group B, Audi are doing demo runs. It wasn't just that, it was, you know, manufacturers, and I think that's the thing. I think with historic rallying in the UK, it wouldn't, the thing, the, the fact that we're so attached to cars from the 70s does bug me a bit because times move on and I think historic rallying should move on. I actually think we should have, the FIA historic should have a rolling thing so every year new cars are allowed uh, and it should probably be 25 years, not 30, um, or 30 plus even. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not just the fact the, uh, the age thing, I think the thing that bugs me in the UK is that it's just one car, isn't it? It's just the Escort. So if historic rallies in the UK were full of Escort, Chevettes, Sunbeams, Stratoses, all, all the, you know, these amazing Group 4 cars, that would be one thing. And I could kind of accept that, but it's just the fact in the UK it's one car. And if you go to Europe, it's such a mix. Yes, you get Escorts, but you get everything else. And you also get different eras, so you get lots of Group A stuff. Go to Belgium, Group uh, Historic Rallying is now, the top of it is just Group A cars. M3s, Sierra Cosworth, Salikas, Deltas, and it's amazing. As well as the older stuff further back down the field. So I think, you know, Barham was just another illustration of how far behind we are when it comes to historics. And it's really frustrating. Like I always say, because I have been accused of being anti-escort, I am not anti-escort, I am anti 
anti-anti-progress, as in we don't progress, and I'm anti one car dominating. It wouldn't matter if it was an Escort or or if historic rallying in the UK did move on to Group A cars and it was all Sierra Cosworths, that would be boring. Or if it was all M3s, that would be boring. It's I'm anti just one car constantly, constantly, constantly. And I think we need to move on from that. So that's one thing that I love about rallies in Europe is that historic rallying in Europe is miles ahead. So that's really good. Um, I suppose the other big thing I want to talk about, um, apart from actually the, the rally, it's well, I do. I'll touch on the rally itself actually. Um, Organisationally, as I said, and this is where Kerry Diggin I think is really moving forward in the UK, is just this being centred around a town, and that is like so many European events. One of the real strong points of Barham is it's based in Slin, which is in the east of the Czech Republic, um, and. The main service park is actually just outside Slin at the Barham Tire Factory, but the ceremonial start and finishes in the city, the Park Ferme is in the city, the historic service park is in the city, and there's controls, and there's always cars in the city, there's posters everywhere, and you just can't not notice that the rally is going on. So that's a one big part of it. The other thing is just, it's the attitude, I think, and the, the mindset, not just of the rally organisers, but of the um, of the competitors and I think that is really important and something that we definitely need to import to the UK. So what I mean by that is I think rallying in the UK is very much aimed at the competitor and I always feel like when I go to Europe that it's obviously the competitor is important but it's also aimed squarely at the fan and that is partly by all the advertising around the cities or the town or wherever that the host, host of the rally is but also um, the crews themselves so we walked around the service park and I'm going to show you I'm going to show you what I've got in here so I was looking at a Clio R3 uh, in the service park so a national competitor not a modern car 10 15 year old car isn't it now getting that way and just looking at the car and I was handed this nice little card picture of the car crew names Sponsors down the bottom, picture of the crew there, look. What a great little gift. This would cost you absolutely nothing to have made. You know, and then we walked, this was, I don't know if this is a Czech national crew. I thought, this look. Another crew had this. You can't see my face look, which is probably a good thing. Again, picture of the car, crew name, sponsors. Everyone. So many teams had these little gifts. Gifts for... The fans, posters, cards, clothing, which obviously you have to buy, but you know, free things like this. Um, that in the UK, that is what we're missing. It's so, so important. It's little bits of merchandise that create memories, isn't it? If you're a, a, a six year old kid and you're getting, you get dragged to a rally and you're walking around the service park and someone hands you a poster or a card. You take that away with you, don't you? That could mean something to you. And I put it on a similar level. I use this example a lot because it was something that I always try to do with my old rally car. If you are in the service park, if you a, a family come and look at your car, if you let their little boy or little girl sit in your car while it's in service, that could be the difference between that child being a rally fan for life, or a marshal for life, or a driver for life, or a co-driver for life. Or if you ignore them, they might never go to a rally again. And I think, you know, this stuff is, is on the same level. It's little things that just make the sport, make the occasion, make the event stick in people's minds. And it was so nice to see that when we were in, in Zlin, is so many of the crews, even competing at the lower levels, just had little gifts for people, were making an effort. And I think that is so, so important. And I know it's difficult in the UK, you know, I know when you're planning, if you're, if you're a private, you know, amateur, clubman, whatever, there's a lot going on. You know, rallying is expensive, you have to buy the car seats, belts, maintenance, all this stuff. And when you're at the rally, you've got a lot going on, your mind's full, you're worried about the time, you're worried about any issues with the car, whatever. But I think so, so important for me is that we all have a duty to promote the sport. It falls on all of us to make the sport an experience for the fans. 
I know a lot of people a lot of people have the attitude that, that rallying is for the competitor, but I do not buy that. Because without the spectator, where do the marshals of the future come from? Where do the drivers of the future come from, the organisers, the co drivers? You know, how does the sport have a future if we don't showcase it to people? So stuff like this, stuff like a nice program like this, uh, little handheld guides like this, or stickers that you can buy like this, all of that makes a difference. So I think that was one of the things that stuck in my mind more than anything from Slim is just crews even running way down the field were, were making the effort to have stuff like this. You know, how much is it going to cost to make a little card in Photoshop and get a hundred of these printed? Nothing. It's so cheap. But it could be the difference between someone taking one of those home and being hooked for the rest of their lives. So, um, yeah, that was a, a big thing. And, and I think if there's lots of things that I would like us to import to the UK from European events, but that stuff is, is one of them. I've talked to that, about that for too long, but I just wanted to touch on it. Um, on the subject, I guess, of merchandise, I'm wearing this rather fetching T-shirt. Oh, I love this T-shirt. I think it's, it's brilliant. So a little play on the Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, logo. Um, I was thinking of doing some Maximum Attack merchandise, so if you'd be interested in that, do put a little comment uh, because I am looking into it. Uh, I know we're, this isn't the biggest channel in the world, but I just thought it'd be fun. I've got some little ideas, so maybe you'd like to see that. And if you'd like to see it, comment and say so. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there, though. Um, as I said, I apologise that this has come a little bit late, so I haven't really done a review of Zlin uh, itself because it seems a bit pointless, you know, two or three weeks after the event. Um, but I wanted to touch a little bit on some of the things that came from it that I found were really important, but also use it as a, a bit of an excuse to talk about uh, Keradikian and, and what I think are the really good things that they're doing and, and how they're probably more than any other event uh, kind of breaking the mould and, and doing new things. So that's really good to see because I think these closed road events are so important for the UK and, and represent the chance to, to really make some big steps forward and, and reach a new audience. So, I think we'll wrap it up there. I hope you have enjoyed this video. I am sorry once again that it's late. I will try my very best to do one next week uh, talking about the Acropolis and then from there hopefully get a bit more regular um, because as I said previously, uh, I want to do a bit more with YouTube. So the first stage to that is actually making some videos, isn't it? So please keep watching. Please like, comment, subscribe and all that usual um, guff and I will hopefully see you in the next video where we will talk about the Acropolis and anything else exciting that's going on in the world. Thanks for watching, catch you next time.